Um, so my my purpose in, in being here this week at all with you guys um, is to uh, is to support you, um, come alongside you in any way that feels helpful. Uh, I mean, ultimately, my, my goal for you is the same as your leader's goals for you, and that is to, uh, to, to kind of like embody the grace of Christ in this community. Um, and you guys are doing that together for like, for like three months or, or whatever long it is, two months, it's a long time, it's like a marathon. Uh, and I'm just doing a sprint for, the, for, the, for these few days. Um, so uh, so what, I like to talk, what I'd like to talk to you about, uh, talk to you about today uh, is shame. I know this is a super fun topic, and you've all been looking forward to it for weeks and weeks, and weeks um, talking about shame, wallowing in shame. Uh, but, uh, uh, but, but one of the reasons that I think it's really necessary to talk about, honestly, is that we, we, uh, we deal with shame a lot more than we think, um, that, that, we're, that we're in it more than we think, more than we know. Um, the only reason that I've, I've kind of made a personal study of the subject for the past uh, couple of years, and the only reason I've done that is that, um, is that I deal with a lot of it. You know, I, uh, I, uh, I experience shame. I get uh, bogged down with shame sometimes. Um, uh, and, and for a long time, it was a total blind spot for me. And I didn't, I didn't even know that I was feeling it most of the time. Uh, I didn't know where it hid. Um, and so my, my, main, um, my main concern, my main hope for this time that we have tonight is to kind of do a few different things. Uh, one, I want to I sort of walk us through what it looks like to learn what shame looks like. So learn how to recognize it. Uh, learn how to recognize its, eff its effects in ourselves and other people. Uh, and learn how we usually respond to it. Um, to kind of go back just a second, one of the reasons that I think shame is important to talk about is not just because it's common, not just because we experience it, but because it really jacks with us. Uh, and it's behind a lot of the stuff that we do, and it's behind a lot of the stuff that we run from. Uh, I think it's one of the one of the biggest hindrances that, that Satan has, one of the biggest tools that Satan has to keep us from growing in Christ. Uh, to keep us from submitting to Christ, to keep us from loving Christ, uh, and to keep us from sensing the grace of Christ towards us. So, um, so I think it's really important to talk about. Um, so, uh, the second second purpose I have is learn how God responds to shame, and how the gospel of Christ applies to it. And then uh, I'd like to begin talking through how we can be a community that works through shame together. So that's one of my main concerns is that like you, once I leave, you guys are going to be here together. You guys are going to go through the next year on your campuses together, uh, and and uh, the Lord is going to be with you. And Satan hates you because you belong to the Lord, uh, and He is going to use shame if He can uh, to 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 mess with you individually, to divide you as a group, uh, to divide you from Christ if He can, to divide you to divide you from the awareness of the grace of Christ, and so. That's why I think it's important. Uh, so tonight's talk, I'm, I'm entitling it "Grace Meets Shame: uh, How God reach out, Reaches Out to the Hidden Through Christ and How We Can Join Him." So, um, yeah, just to recap, I'd, I'd like to learn what shame is and why it matters. Learn how to recognize shame. This is kind of a uh, redo of what I just said. So, um, first, I'm going to give you some resources that relate to this topic. In case you want to do some study later on, I'll I'll come back to these if we need to. So Dr. Brene Brown is a, is a researcher. She might be a Christian, we're not sure, uh, but she talks as if she were Christian sometimes. She does not address the gospel, though, so that's, that's, her, that's her weakness. But one of the things that she does really well is she talks about shame and imperfection and how it messes with us um, really well. She's done a lot of research on it, and so as far as like the human problem of shame and the emotion of shame and how, and how it works, she's got a really good... Uh, finger on that pulse. Um, so these are two books that she's written about that. Uh, this guy is a, uh, he's a counselor, he's a Christian counselor. Um, uh, I forget where he is, I think North Carolina, maybe, no, Pennsylvania. So uh, he wrote a book called uh, Shame Interrupted, uh, and this is gospel-based. So he does a really good good job of like going into theologically uh, what shame is, um, how God sees shame, how he deals with shame, uh, and how, how the gospel and the Bible deals with shame, that kind of thing. So, 
if you want further study. This is probably the best book on this subject. Uh, the Soul of Shame is what I've been using and reading. Um, this is probably what I'd recommend. Um, so if you, if you read one book about shame, it's this one, probably. It's what I'd recommend. Um, so these are some questions that I'm going to ask. Uh, what is shame? Where does shame hide? How do we usually deal with shame? How does God's grace address our shame? And how can we cooperate with God in helping others stuck in shame? Uh, and then how do we slow down enough to allow shame to come out of hiding? That's another trick of this. Um, so uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read you a poem. We're going to look at the shame, like, like the, the phenomenon, the feeling, the emotion, uh, from, a, from a couple of different angles here, okay? So this is a poem written by Ed Welsh. What is shame? You are shunned. Faces are turned away from you. They ignore you as if you didn't exist. You are naked. Faces are turned towards you. They stare at you as if you were hideous. You are worthless and it's no secret. You are of little or no value to those whose opinions matter to you. Um, so on the one hand, when we read something like that, we can think, wow, that's kind of a Debbie Downer thing. Uh, wish, wish that had been a little bit more upbeat. upbeat. Um, so that's one, that's, one, uh, that's one reaction, definitely. Um, there's another reaction, though, uh, that I would guess at one time in your life you have felt at least one of these. Maybe you've felt all three. Um, and, and maybe even during this past year you've felt one of these things. Uh, or, or maybe you can relate to one of these things. This is to give you an idea of what we're talking about when we talk about shame. Um, I'd like to give you another illustration of it. Okay, under your under your chairs, there's a note card and an envelope. All right. So I'd like you. Does, does everybody have a pen? Everybody have a pen? I have a pen. And these. Okay. <coughs> So what I'd like you to do, once you have a pen, I'd like you to take the note card. Nobody's allowed to look at anybody else's card here, okay? So eyes forward, take your note card, and I want you to take a second to think about um, to think about a secret that you've never told anyone. You don't have to write it out as a narrative or anything like that, but you do need to put uh, three to five words on there that describe it. Okay? Again, nobody's looking at anybody else's paper, so you're just going to hold it right there. Nobody's going to read this, okay? including me. So it's three to five words, five would be great, on this secret that you've never told anyone. All right? And if you don't have one of those, then um, the, the most shameful moment that you can remember. All right? So I'm going to give you a few minutes to think about this. <clears throat> Don't overthink it too much. <clears throat> Again, no one's going to read it. Okay, and I'd like you to put it in the envelope. And you're done. to seal it up. Okay. And I'd like you to write your first name on the front of it. Right there? Okay. And I'd like you to pass it to someone else in your room. So that feeling that just came up just then when you passed when I said pass it to someone else in your row, 
that's pretty close to shame right there. It's the fear of traumatic exposure. So it's, it's the fear that we feel uh, when something that we really need to keep hidden is about to get blown out, right? And this wasn't even real. You may not have felt it, but if you did, uh, and that's that's a little piece of shame right there. Uh, it's it's the desperation that we have that the stuff that's hidden, the stuff that can really hurt us, this kind of soft underbelly uh, that makes us feel worthless, makes us feel weak, whatever it is, um, the stuff that we really guard. Hardcore. Uh, that stuff is the stuff that we're ashamed of. <clears throat> that feeling that you just felt is, is shame. Okay? So that's another illustration of what it feels like and what it is. Right? So a lot of times when we talk about shame, um, it's, uh, it's talked about as an emotion. And it's also sometimes we talk about like messages of shame. I don't know if you guys have heard this language. Um, uh, like, uh, like, uh, like bad self-esteem or self-hate or something like that. So it's, it's an emotion, but it's also a physiological state. So it's also something that your body does um, while it's having thoughts about shame. So it's not just a thought. It's not just a, it's not just a oh, crap, I hope, I hope nobody finds out about that. It's also something that happens in your body at the same time. So can anyone tell me which one of these is shame? Have you found it yet? Bottom, bottom right, second from the right. Okay, so this is shame. So uh, some, some group of people, I don't know who it was, I just found this on the internet. Some group of people did a study and they measured uh, body heat in people that were, that were responding to, to different like, like emotional stimuli, like a movie clip or something like that. Um, and so they measured body temperature, and this is what they got for all these different emotions, right? Uh, so you can see with shame, the brightest thing is the cheeks, okay? So what happens in your body when you're feeling shame is that your cheeks and your neck get flushed. So they get red, they get warm. You also get uh, a little bit of a pit in your chest, in your, in your, in your, like in the top part of your stomach. Um, a lot of people describe like their legs and their arms getting kind of tired, like you suddenly feel like there's a weight on you. Um, a lot of people say that they, they don't want to make eye contact all of a sudden. Uh, sometimes it feels like you want to put a pillow in front of you or like a, like a, you want to cross your arms or something like that. Um, but the most common things are like uh, breaking eye contact, looking away, crossing my arms, putting something in between myself and another person. Um, before I go on, has, it, has anyone felt this before? Do you guys know what I'm talking about? Okay. All right. So, um, so if, if you know what I'm talking about, great. If you don't, then this week what I'd like you to do is notice what happens in your body when you're in situations that might make, might make you feel ashamed. Okay. We're going to talk about some other ways that you can recognize shame. <laughs> All right? Um, so, but I guess the, the biggest thing that I want to bring out about shame is that, like, in the messages that it sends, in what it does in your body and in your brain, um, in what it does spirit, in what it does to you spiritually and in your heart, like, it, its goal is to isolate you and to disintegrate you. So, like... Its goal is to separate you from the Lord, separate you from other people, and even like inside of you, uh, separate you from, from yourself. Like break you up into pieces that don't talk to each other. Um, and we'll talk about that, how that looks in scripture in a few minutes here. Um, Alright, so uh, I'd like to give some examples of, of like stories that can embody this, right? So, uh, so in the poem that I read, there were three categories. One of them is rejection, shame, feeling shame from rejection. One of them is feeling shame from being exposed, like, uh, like getting your pants pulled down or something like that, right? Uh, another one is getting, uh, feeling shame from being treated as worthless, nothing, or of little value of consequence. So like getting passed over, being invisible, being ignored, that kind of thing. Um, so rejection doesn't have to be like uh, like everybody hates you. It can be pretty simple. It can be like a like a nasty breakup. It can be 
um, like your friend not returning your calls. Uh, it can be like your girlfriend uh, kind of not being as happy to see you as she was last week. Um, it can be your mom screaming at you when you were eight or calling you names when you were eight or 10 or 12 or whatever it is, right? It can be your dad leaving. It can be a lot of different things. Um, feeling exposed, it can be a, a shameful sin pattern that gets, that gets found out, right? That can bring up a feeling of shame. Um, it can be just being in that same shameful sin pattern and knowing that, that nobody knows about it except you and it's just a matter of time before somebody finds out. Right? That can feel like shame. Um, Exposure can be literal nakedness. Um, it can also be uh, boundary violations, like uh, uh, like sometimes in, in some families when your kids uh, there there's there's like personal space, there's emotional space that you're supposed to have when you're a kid uh, that, that your parents are supposed to like sort of protect for you because you don't know how to do it, and sometimes that doesn't happen in some families. And so uh, sometimes just um, Having your emotional boundaries crossed can, can feel like shame. Um, sometimes uh, you can. The third category, you can you can feel ignored, not seen, or forgotten about. Uh, this can be like getting passed over um, romantically. This can be getting passed over in school. This can be getting passed over um, in church uh, for leadership positions. Um, this can be a lot of different things that can bring up these feelings of shame. Um, suffering can bring it on uh, when we're not as strong as we thought we were. Uh, that kind of thing. Uh, so those are some examples. Um, so I'd like to pause right here and see if any of you have any examples that you want to throw out. If you don't, that's totally fine. I'll give you like one minute. And if nobody talks, I'll just move on. Maybe less than a minute. We'll see how long. I think in high school, there was a time where I got pulled from a game, a basketball game, got yelled at mm -hmm. from the bench. And our bench was right in front of our student crowd. Mm -hmm. Just feeling like incredibly, uh, kind of both, probably exposed and, well, maybe all three of those actually. So, <clears throat> yeah, this is one of the most vivid memories I have with like basketball. In yeah. High That'd be a strong one. That'd be a really strong one. I think for me, I was a kicker in high school, and any time I missed a field goal, I'd get it in. I felt horrible. Yeah. So you kind of recognize that feeling? Yeah. <coughs> yeah. I was supposed to play keyboard in a church, a school of people. Uh huh. There's these moments of the music where it's only the keyboard playing. Uh huh. And then I forgot that. The notes, I forgot everything. So it was like the awkward silence. And then I tried to make something, it was uh, completely wrong. Oh. So that's, it was really, and that was the first time I ever felt like, you know, like very sweaty. Yeah. But, oh man. Yeah, it was horrible. Like your adrenaline kicks in and yeah, you're kind of yeah. like, oh man. Yeah. I, uh, so one time in junior high, there was this girl that I thought really liked me. And so we had been junior high going on for like a week, which is, in junior high is like a month. Uh, and so we had been junior high going on for about a week, and she said, yeah, pick me up at eight. And so pick me up at eight meant that my mom dropped me off at her house, and she was gonna ride the back seat with me. That's what that's what picked me up. Meant. So we pulled up to her house, and she was not there. She'd gone on vacation, and she hadn't told me. And I found out later that she had just told me that to make another guy jealous. And so like in that moment, like I, it was just like um, so. It was that it was that feeling for me at that time? And I've got lots of other stories. I'm sure you do too. But thank you so much for for jumping into that with me. So we're we're kind of tracking with what this feels like. That's good. I'd like to get some some uh, some examples of shame from scripture. One of the things that I want to draw out here uh, is an important distinction that that's between vulnerability and shame. I'm going to come back to this later. But they're two different things. Vulnerability. Is, um, is something that we experience all the time in life. It's something we can't avoid. It's like the fact that, um, that emotionally, physically, spiritually, I'm really limited. I'm, I'm even weak sometimes, right? I'm sinful. Um, 
I, I constantly stand before a holy God that uh, if he wanted to, he would be totally just in striking me down uh, if it weren't for the grace of Christ. But we, but we live our lives, um, like I can get cancer, uh, my wife is a very godly woman, she loves me, um, she could leave me, I could leave her, one of my kids could die, um, one of your parents could die, uh, your best friend could leave the faith, you know, there, there's so many things that we're vulnerable to that could happen to us, lots of those things have happened to you guys, right, so maybe you have a taste of, of what life can bring you as far as vulnerability. Right? The ultimate version of vulnerability is that, um, is that at all times we're standing naked before the Lord, right? And someday that's going to be really, really apparent to us. It's going to be right there in our faces. But that's true anyway. That's true all the time of us. Um, so that's vulnerability, and that's just a part of life. That's always there. The Lord made us that way. He made us like, we don't, know, we don't have like a hard exoskeleton. I don't have claws or teeth. I can run really fast. Um, I'm not that smart. I'm moderately smart. I'm not that smart. Um, I, I can't uh, adjust space and time to suit my limbs. Um, there's so many things that I can't control, and that's vulnerability, right? And that's just a part of life. That's how God made us. That's not sin. What evil does is it twists vulnerability and makes it into shame. It makes it something uh, that sets me apart from, from the rest of humanity. And it makes it so that uh, so that I feel like I cannot approach the Lord, and I cannot ever be acceptable before Him or before other people. So those are two different things. Uh, from the very beginning, I want to show you the difference. Now, although Adam and his wife were both naked, neither of them felt any shame. That's vulnerability. That's like the quintessential vulnerability: is being naked in front of a woman. Um, but they didn't feel any shame. So vulnerability and shame were two totally separate things at the very beginning, right? Um, but then there came a moment where they sinned and they were separated from the Lord. So when they were cast, when they were spiritually separated from the Lord, suddenly vulnerability and shame went like like that, and suddenly they we, we couldn't tease them apart anymore. We couldn't get them apart. So at that moment, their eyes were opened and they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. Toward evening, they heard the Lord God walking about in the garden, so they hid themselves among the trees. The Lord God called to Adam, where are you? He replied, I heard you, so I hid, which had never been true before. I was afraid because I was naked. And so God asks a question that's kind of weird at first blush, but actually kind of makes sense. Who told you that you were naked? Because, parentheses, this has never been a big problem before, right? You've always been naked in front of each other and in front of me, and all of a sudden now it's a problem. Of course, he knew the answer. Uh, it's because they had declared themselves independent from him. And so suddenly, there was nothing to protect them from evil. There was nothing to protect them from the knowledge of their vulnerability that evil wanted to give them. All right, so another one. Um, uh, this is from Isaiah 52. Uh, As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind, where he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. Um, it says he had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. This is talking about Jesus. And it shows us that Jesus knows uh, what we feel, he's not immune from it. He didn't make himself separate from it. He put himself right in the middle of it. Um, this is when he's dealing with, uh, with a sinner, a, a prostitute, basically. One of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. And behold, a woman of the city, who was a sinner, that's a fancy name for a prostitute, when she learned that he was reclining at table in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster flask of ointment, which was like uh, like uh, perfume that she would use for her trade. It was really, really valuable. And standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. So she's making herself really, really vulnerable. She's the only woman in a group of men that are all judging her and all thinking about how she doesn't belong there and how she's really rejectable and how she's worthless and not even worth looking at. Uh, and then she's taking her hair um, and she's wiping 
Jesus' feet with it, and Jesus' feet is full of like poop and dirt from the street. It's not clean. So she's taking her hair and she's wiping it, uh, and she's drying it, and she, she's washing her his feet with her tears. Uh, and then the Pharisees start drudging her out loud. Uh, now when the Pharisee who invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. So just kind of confirming what they were thinking the whole time. Um, what I want you to see here is that the woman uh, doesn't seem to care that she's really, really vulnerable. She doesn't seem to feel ashamed. She just, she does this voluntarily. She doesn't get made to do this. Nobody forces her to do it. Nobody forces her to come in among these men and like let her hair down and then wipe her, you know, get her hair dirty uh, and, and subject herself to ridicule. She comes in because the Lord Jesus is there. Um, and she knows that he's merciful and she knows that he's good and that his heart is kind. And so the person of Jesus and the presence of Jesus is the only thing that separates vulnerability from shame for her. It's the only thing that separates them. Right? If he weren't there, they'd be right back together again. That's important. Um, this is another snapshot. Uh, this is his crucifixion. And the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters and they gathered the whole battalion. So a bunch of men in, uh, in armor uh, with weapons. And they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, pretending that he was king. And they twisted together a crown of thorns, which make it, made him bleed and, uh, yeah. So they put it on his head and put a reed in his right hand, and kneeling before him, they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. So they're just making fun of him. Um, and they spit on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. So they're beating him. They're taking advantage of his weakness. And when they crucified him, they divided his garments among them by casting lots, which um, sometimes when I read this, my eyes are down on the ground with the soldiers that are like ripping this cloth up. But I, I don't often look up at the cross to Jesus, and he's totally naked. He's, like a lot of times in pictures, we picture him with like a, at least a loincloth or something, like something down there to cover his business. There's nothing. When people were, were, were crucified, they were stripped completely naked. So when it says uh, his garments, divided his garments among them by casting lots, it's everything. Right? He, he didn't get anything to preserve his dignity. Um, so he's, uh, he's up in front of everyone totally naked and he's bleeding and he's crying out and he's having trouble breathing. So that, that is a, this is a picture of, of shame that I don't think any of us will ever experience. Um, but I think what it shows us is that uh, our Lord Jesus understands it. He understands that feeling and uh, we're not alone in it. So he's with us in it because he, uh, he did this for us. Uh, so he went, no matter what pit of shame you're in, he went all the way down to the very bottom of it. He went lower than you to, to the worst piece of crap on the bottom of the barrel. That's where he was, right? No matter how bad you feel. And he got underneath you, um, and he suffered this willingly so that he could bring you back up with him, right? With his vindication and his resurrection. So he, this is how much he loves you. Um, and then it just goes on to more people deriding him, more people mocking him. Um, so, uh, that's shame. Uh, I'd like to talk some about now, like where it hides and cause it's kind of sneaky and it, um, it hides really well. So I'm going to talk about that a little bit. Um, shame is a feeling in our bodies and our brains, but it also hides in stories. Actually, before I go into this, do, does anyone have any questions? You may not have any questions at this point. You guys still with me? Sort of tracking a little bit. Questions? Okay. Um, so, where does shame hide? So, it's an emotion that's sometimes hard to, to identify. Here are some places it can hide that that don't feel like shame to us, but sometimes shame is behind other emotions. So, depression. Uh, I'm super sad, I can't, I can't feel any happiness, I can't see any hope. 
Um, sometimes the story behind that, not always, but sometimes, is something like, I'm irredeemable. I'm, there's, there's no good that can come out of me. I'm just a piece of dirt, uh, and there is no help for me. So not even the Lord can help me. My friends can't help me. I'm a goner. Uh, anger. Stay away or you'll see me. Now, we don't think this. We don't say this. Sometimes this is what's going on. Sometimes this has become so automatic, like we flip from shame into anger so fast in like milliseconds. It becomes such a habit that we don't even notice it anymore. So sometimes um, when I'm leading people through shame and like identifying shame, it means like looking at their other emotions and looking for the root of shame underneath and slowing down enough that they can feel it, that they can feel like anger, but then even before that, they can feel shame, right? Because they're two different things. Um, so sometimes anger says, stay away from me or you'll see me. So like, uh, for instance, uh, I just got exposed uh, doing, you know, let, let's say I got exposed uh, messing up or I screwed up something or I didn't get something in on time or something, someone was counting on me for something. So that's, that's an opportunity for shame, but maybe instead of shame, I feel anger. Like I, I get pissed and I, uh, I sort of fight back. And I talk about how the expectation was trapped to begin with. Uh, I talk about how, um, like, well, you're not perfect either. Um, or how dare you accuse me or something like that, right? So do you see how shame can be something we're feeling, but then it flips over to ang into anger real fast? Okay. Or, you know, you will not expose my weakness, so I'm going to push back on you real hard to let you know you can't do that. Um, so, another thing is fear or withdrawal. Uh, so, sometimes when people fear, feel shame, like they, the first instinct is to get out of the room. Um, so, it can be, I, it can be a story like, uh, I will be rejected, left out, because that's, always, that's what always happens. If these guys really found out who I was, uh, or if this girl found out who I was, uh, who I really am, what I'm really like, then I'm, she's, she's going to reject me out of hand, or they're going to reject me out of hand, so I might as well leave now. Um, I don't belong here, so I can't bear to other, for, for other people to feel that, to, to find that out, because it'd just be too painful, so I'm going to leave now, or I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get quiet now, or something like that. Um, so another one is... Uh, Exhibitionism and partying. So, like, this is uh, like dancing on the table, lampshade on the head, getting drunk, getting as drunk as you can, or um, you know, on a on a more tame side, it can just be like um, uh, just life the party. Like, you're you're just the one that's always up. You're always the funny guy. You're always the one that's that's like out in front of everybody, making everybody laugh. Um, and that can be like a really joyful thing and a thing that's God given and a real gift. And also, sometimes, maybe you guys have experienced this, maybe you haven't, but it can be something that says, um, if I act like this, then I can believe for a minute that there's nothing to be ashamed of, right? So if I, even if I have something to be ashamed of, when I get out in front of people and I'm the life of the party and everybody's eyes are on me and I see adoration and acceptance there, then I don't feel ashamed, I feel approved of. Like, I, I feel great, even though I'm totally risking everything. I'm acting, I'm acting like a fool, or maybe I'm acting funny, or maybe I'm, I'm like really, you know, out there for people. Um, I don't feel ashamed. I don't feel vulnerable because this is distracting me from my real shame. Um, some other places I can hide. I'll, I'll move through these quickly. Um, so addiction. Um, I don't know how many of you struggle with pornography. I, um, I would guess it's it's some of you at least. Um, pornography is part of my story. Uh, I think if you talk to some of the leaders here, it'll be part of their story as well. Um, so the thing about pornography or uh, alcohol or sex or other addictions, things that like kind of seek seek a meat hook into you and won't let go. Um, the thing about them is that uh, shame feeds them. Shame makes them stronger. Shame makes them almost inescapable. So there's there's something called a shame cycle. It just kind of turns over and over and over again. And so you, um, I'm just going to talk about the story here. Um, so addiction sometimes says I can't and won't live with this feeling of worthlessness. Like I feel worthless all the time. I hate it. I don't deserve this. I'm not going to feel it anymore. 
So I'm going to find some way to get out of it. I'll escape. Um, and besides, I'm no better than this. It's not like I have some dignity to preserve uh, that's going to make me not sleep with this girl or not do this drug or not look at this pornography. It's not, it's not like I'm better than this. Because shame always comes in the back door and says, oh, really, you're going you're gonna to walk away from this? You're, really, you are. You are. After all that you've done, you're going you're gonna to turn goody two-shoes now? <clears throat> I don't know if you guys have ever heard that voice, but it's, um, that's one of the tricks that Satan likes to use on us, and shame likes to use on us. Um, so, uh, another one. Uh, I don't know if any of you have ever had suicidal thoughts or ever thought about killing yourself or hurting yourself. Um, you wouldn't be alone if you, if you had. Uh, sometimes the thought behind suicide that, that hides shame is, I would rather die than be exposed or, hum or humiliated anymore. So I'm, I feel so humiliated, I, see, I feel so exposed, I feel so out there in front of everybody that I can't stand it anymore. I'd rather die than experience one more minute of this. So I can't take it anymore. Um, and you'd be surprised how many people that, that think about suicide or, or actually try suicide, this is one of the main motivations, it's just shame. Um, uh, social anxiety, social fear. Uh, I can't bear to be exposed as an outsider. I feel like an outsider all the time, but I, I can't bear for that to be apparent. Uh, so I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna be my myself, by myself. Shame, uh, shame shows up in stories that have you at the center and talk about how someone else is likely to react to you. All right, so they can show up in other stories like uh, doubts that anyone could ever love me. Um, how could anyone ever love anyone so gross or insignificant or weak? Uh, it could be trouble forgiving yourself. I believe God has forgiven me, but I'm still dirty. It would feel wrong to let me off the hook. What would other people say? Right. So that's a pretty ballsy one, actually, uh, because you're saying that uh, uh, what other people would say and what I think about me, myself or my sin or my weakness is more important than what the Lord says. But we do this all the time. Um, uh, failure is another word that describes it. Uh, perfectionism, I will prove that I'm worthy of love and belonging by just doing this so well that no one will ever question it. Right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this perfectly uh, and everyone's going to see that I'm, that I'm not weak or that I'm not insignificant. Right, that I'm worth being around. All right, so um, another one. Uh, this is something that's, that's pretty prevalent in our culture. It's almost a uh, family value in, in a way. Um, it's escapism. Um, we have so many ways. Of, we have more ways of escaping mentally and emotionally now than we ever have in the history of mankind. Like we've got, we've got um, escaping machines uh, in our hands all the time. Every minute. Uh, so this is a this is a big problem for most of us. Maybe not for you, but for most of us. Um, and sometimes this is what it says. Not always. Sometimes you just want to play a game on your phone. That's cool. Uh, but sometimes um, when it's when you're under stress, when you're feeling really ashamed, when you're um, when you failed, and you don't want to think about it, uh, I have no hope of proving my worthiness. So I'll find another better story to live in. Uh, sometimes this is what's behind pornography uh, and our addiction to pornography is this pattern that we set up in our minds and our hearts that says, if I feel worthless, if I feel weak, if I feel insignificant, um, the fastest way to get rid of that and go to the opposite is pornography. So I'm just going to go to that. And our brains get used to it, and pretty soon it's, it's kind of what we go to. Um, so... All right, so um, one of the main things that I want to bring out of, about this, about, about why shame matters, uh, is that they make us sub, it, shame makes us subhuman. It makes us feel subhuman. It makes us feel like, uh, like the worst piece of crap that, 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 is, that is in our community, right? So this can happen when you're, uh, when you're in sin, when you're in a chronic sin, and you feel like you're kind of alone in it. And you feel like if other people found out about it, they'd probably see you pretty differently. Um, the message of shame there is that uh, because of this, you're different than anybody else, right? You are uniquely sinful. You're uniquely weak. You're uniquely not really a man. Um, 
or you're uniquely not worth following, right? And so uh, that's that's the message that shame tells to us a lot of times. Um, so, oh, okay, all right. Um, I'm going to tie all this together, and then we're going to move on to something else. Okay. So sometimes what this looks like in real life um, is that I'll have a an image of a shameful act, right? Something from my past, a memory or something like that. Maybe this has happened to you. Or a time when you were traumatically exposed, like um, sometimes if, if people have suffered from sexual abuse, those memories and those images can come back pretty strong and they trigger shame reactions. So the, the memories of abuse can be can be an entrance into shame. Um, so you, you have an image of that or a memory of it, right? That's the first thing in the, in the cycle. What that brings is like a tightening of the chest, um, distraction, your brain kind of goes offline, your eyes drop, uh, and um, and your brain starts working along shameful lines, right? It's, it's easier, when you're feeling shame like this, it's a lot easier for your brain to come up with a shameful story than it would be if you're like picking flowers with something different, right? If you're if you're doing great and you're and you're good with all your friends and everybody's happy with you and everybody loves you, um, or if you're really at peace with the Lord, then you, you don't you know you don't have this feeling as much, and so the shame stories don't they can't find a find a foothold right they don't get in. But if you're feeling this way, if you just had a horrible memory, and then you do this, um, your body does this, then it's going to be a lot easier for you to just stay there. And all you can think about is all the crappy things that you've done and how you're not good enough and how nobody's ever really going to love you or accept you or you're never going to be able to find a wife or whatever it is. Um, it's a lot easier to go there when you're there. Uh, so the story kicks in uh, from this. I'm alone. Or it can be something like they have to see and love me and accept me. So sometimes this can be um, like I feel shame, so I perform. Like I got to get better, I got to speed up. I gotta, I gotta do better next time, um, or it can be, um, I don't belong here, so I gotta leave. I feel shame, so I'm out. Um, and then the next thing in the cycle is the physical sensation gets worse. It's not just a thought; it's also what your body's doing, what your brain's doing, right? So it actually gets worse because of this. And then the need to hide or to act out to get rid of that feeling gets a lot worse. So. If you were feeling um, like you wanted to look at pornography before this, then when this memory comes up, and then you feel this, and then this mes message comes through, maybe you're not thinking it, but it's something like uh, a feeling like, I'm totally alone, nobody cares about me. Um, or if this girl doesn't like me, I don't know what I'm gonna do. Um, or I don't belong with this group, I don't belong in CO, I don't belong with these leaders, whatever it is. Um, and then the feelings get worse. Sometimes they can even be like physically painful. And then we feel the need to hide or act out to get rid of that. Real, like it can, it can get really intense. Uh, and then a lot of times what we'll do is we'll use a juke move. Um, and I'm going to tell you what the juke moves are. A juke move, everybody know what a juke move is? You're all much better athletes than I am, so I'm sure you know what a juke move is. Um, a juke move is where you, where you dodge something, right? And we have had 20 plus years, a lot of us, at like dodging shame and doing something with it besides just feeling it. Most of us, when we feel shame, we, we've learned not to just kind of sit in it and wallow in it and feel it for what it really is. We turn it into something else or we dodge it or we try and figure something else out to do. Um, so there are three juke moves that I want to share with you. These are not the only ones, but these are the ones that I've come up with that describe most of what I've seen in my own life and other people's lives as I counsel. Um, and there, there are three of them. One of them is forget and forge ahead. Another one is isolate and rewrite. And this one is numb and jump. So I'm going to explain what they are. All right. Everybody with me? Everybody here? All right. I know you guys are tired. I would be. I would be so exhausted if I were you guys. Hang with me. Okay. Uh, so forget and forge ahead. Um, in this situation, like if if this is you, then you know it because when you feel shame, you just get faster and you get more efficient and you get better. So like your first thought is, um, okay, that's over. Get it. Get it behind me. 
I got to do better next time, so I'm going to power up. Um, shame makes makes you work harder and longer. Um, okay, I didn't complete that sentence, but uh, what I was trying to say there is, um, if let's say uh, let's say your emotions are like a book, and you're turning the pages moment by moment, one minute two minutes, three minutes, and then you come to a page that's uh, dirty and smelly and it's got a bunch of scribbling on it, right? And that's shame. That's what shame feels like. And you're like, oh, okay, uh, I don't want to be here. I want to get on with the story. So these guys, what their instinct is, you just flip the page. You don't look at it. You don't dwell on it. You don't think about it. You don't worry about it. You just flip the page and you resolve never to go back there again, right? So whatever that mistake was, I'm never going to make it again. Whatever that vulnerability was, I'm never going to put myself in that position again where someone can take advantage of me like that. Um, so you forget what just happened as fast as possible. Um, so yeah, you work hard to write the shame out of the next page. How do I avoid shame next time? Does anyone, um, you don't have to raise your hand if you want to, but if you're brave, like, uh, does anyone feel this at all? This resonate with anybody? Okay, a few of you. All right. All right, so that's one juke move. Uh, if that's you, or if you if you if you identify with this, I want you to write a, write down a scripture. It's First John, one six through ten. All right. Okay, the next one is isolate and rewrite. Um, for, for this kind of person, um, when you feel shame, uh, it brings the urge to pull back from what went wrong uh, or got exposed. So you, uh, it's not that you, you need to move on from it and be better, it's that you gotta pull back from it and reinterpret it, right? So if I screwed up, or if I made a mistake, or if I went to porn, or if I uh, was really mean to somebody and everybody <laughs> saw it, whatever it is, um, then my first thing, my first instinct is, uh, this cannot be my fault, not again. I cannot freaking believe I'm back here. Um, whose fault is it? I can't bear it for it to be my fault again, so it's gotta be somebody else's. So, uh, who do you go to? Who do you jump to? That's the question for, uh, for isolate and rewrite. Um, you have to rewrite the story so that you're not at fault, so that you don't have, you don't have to feel the shame. You rewrite the story so that someone else has to feel the shame instead of you, right? So in sports, this can be if I missed a block, it's not my fault. It was the guy next to me. He missed the block. I was just I was in the right place. He missed it. The guy went left. I was where I was supposed to be, right? Or if it's um, uh. Yeah, if you if you shot your mouth out off at somebody, or if you were if you were mean to somebody, right? Um, well, they provoked me. They made me mad. They made me do it. If they hadn't said those things, then I wouldn't have had to yell at them, right? So it can be it can be that kind of thing. Um, if we're if we're going out back to the book analogy, then you get to the dirty page, and uh, what this person does is they start to cross out all the parts of that page that bring on shamefulness, that feel like shame. And they start to um, so they, they start to cross out all the places where they're at fault, and they start to underline all the places where they've been wronged. Right? So all the places where I'm the victim, I'm gonna underline those. Right? And all the places where I, I own the shame or where I should be feeling vulnerable or exposed or something like that, I'm gonna cross them out. Um, but the problem with this is that you have to get away from anybody who's gonna who's gonna like contradict your edits. You have to get away from anybody that's gonna call you and say, wait, no. That actually was you, or wait, no, that really did happen to you, and it was wrong. Um, okay, so, so the problem with this one is that it makes you really alone. Uh, after a while, there's there's not many people that have the right to speak into your life because this is how you relate, this is how you relate to shame. Does anyone, you know, I, I mean, I've I've certainly experienced this one before. Has anyone experienced this one with you? Okay. Um, so. The scripture for this one is 1 Corinthians 4, 3 through 5. All right. I'll go on to the last one. Uh, so this one's called Numb and Jump. This is my personal favorite. This is the one I, I often go to. Um, so if I don't have a sense of competence uh, to do better next time, 
uh, or if I don't have the energy or the anger required to edit my shame onto other people, then I may have to switch stories. I may just have to jump out of reality altogether and find something else that I can live in. So this can be TV, this can be video games, this can be books, this can be porn, this can be relationships, this can be all sorts of stuff, right? The only requirement um, is that, uh, like, I, I feel shame and then I just jump to something else, right? It's called numb and jump because I don't want to feel it anymore. I don't want to feel anything except something I can control. So I'll go to a, I'll go to a movie that makes me feel something I want to feel. Or I'll go to a video game that gives me a sense of accomplishment or challenge or something like that. Um, so whatever the new story makes me feel, it's better than shame. Can anyone identify with that one? Yeah? Okay. I've got some brothers in here. Um, so the scripture for this one is 1 Peter 1.13. So I, I would love to stop. And I mean, there, there's like three or four Bible studies in here that we can do. Um, what I'd love for you to do is to go back to these scriptures this week or next week or whenever you get the time to do it uh, and kind of sit with them a little bit. Um, think through them and maybe even memorize them. Um, when, we're, when we're able to memorize these scriptures, uh, the Lord has a way of bringing them to mind when we need them, right? So if they're in there, uh, and, and if the word of Christ is dwelling in you richly, then a lot of times the Lord can, can use the Holy Spirit to bring it up when we need it. Uh, he's really good at that. So um, the goal of shame, right? Uh, why shame bothers with, uh, with the feelings in your stomach? Why shame bothers with the stories in your head? Why shame bothers with teaching you the juke moves? so that you use them all the time. Um, uh, shame's goal is the same one that, that Satan has for us, and that is to isolate us and disintegrate beautiful things that God has made and is redeeming. Um, and that especially goes for people that Christ has bought with his blood. Right? So Satan hates creation. He hates people made in God's image. He especially hates people made in God's image that Christ has redeemed. He hates your guts. Um, because you remind him of Jesus. Um, so, so he is going to send shame as his ambassador to uh, isolate you, to make, um, to make your heart crack and pull apart, uh, to make um, the part of you that goes to church on Sunday be totally different from the part of you that sits at home at night in your bed. Uh, thinking about whether to sin sexually. He wants those to, to be totally separate, right? And he wants he wants uh, the church boy to not ever really think about the guy at home at night, and he wants the guy at home at night in front of his computer to not ever really think about, uh, about the promises of the gospel. He just wants them to be totally separate people, and the best <coughs> thing he has to do that is shame. He loves to use shame to do that. Um, okay. So, um, all right, so uh, shame is, a, is like a twisted, marred version of vulnerability. Remember I talked about vulnerability with Genesis 2 and 3? It's a, it's a twisted version of vulnerability, um, and God designed us for that. Uh, this is a good example of vulnerability. Um, Satan and sin love to hijack our bodies and minds and spirits to turn vulnerability into shame, which isolates and destroys. Um, now we get to the good part, um, and I want to get you guys out of here in 15 minutes, okay? So uh, what I'm going to do is then I'm going to give you some, uh, some, they're basically steps, some principles, some things that you can apply to shame, and um, you're not going to absorb this tonight probably. This is going to be something that I'd love for you guys as a community to, to sort of work on in the coming weeks. Um, God addresses shame. Uh, by being who and what he is near you and with you. So there's two parts of that that are really important. One is that God, uh, God gets to be who he is, so that means he gets to be absolutely holy, which also means that, unfortunately, uh, we have to feel vulnerable in front of him. Right? I used to hate talking about God's holiness. I used to hate it so much. Uh, but I'll, I'll tell you about that in a minute. We can cooperate with him. 
Uh, the first one, and I would like you to write these down. These are, if you get nothing else from this talk, I'd like you to remember these. Okay. The first one is remember your lineage. When you feel shame, remember your lineage. He is good and glorious, the Lord is, and what he makes is good and glorious. Now we're all sinful, we're all marred and twisted by sin, but we also have glory, we also have strength, we're also men made in his image. And the scripture for that is Genesis 1, 26 through 27. It's the original image of God passage. You guys ever read um, the Chronicles of Narnia? Some of you have? Okay, so there's a passage in there where um, where Aslan is talking to one of the one of the kids, and he says something like, um, uh, you are a son of Adam, and that is glory enough to lift the head of the lowliest beggar, and that is shame enough to uh, to drop the head or drop the eyes of the highest king. Right? So he's saying being a man made in God's image is both glorious, it's so glorious that uh, that shame can't take it away from you. Shame can't erase your manhood, shame can't make you anything but a grown man made in God's image, and that's glorious. That's a beautiful, beautiful thing. And you can't talk yourself out of it, and no one else can either, right? So that is a beautiful thing. You have to remember your lineage. Um, a lot of what shame does is try and convince us that this is not true. That somehow we're subhuman, that there's men, and then there's us. Or there's Christian men, and then there's us. Right? So we have to we have to remember our lineage. Next one. Uh, remember and imagine his holiness and grace. Um, this one matters because it is because of his holiness that his grace matters for you. If God was not holy and strong and good and all-powerful, then we wouldn't really care if he had grace for us or not. The gospel would not really matter to us because his word wouldn't matter to us. Right? Would you rather have the approval of someone you respect uh, and look up to, or someone that you don't respect. We would all rather have the the the, uh, the approval of someone that we respect. Um, so I say Isaiah six uh, because Isaiah six is one of those passages that like paints a picture for you. And if you haven't read it, it's where um, uh, Isaiah goes before uh, the Lord in his throne room, and he's almost crushed. Uh, like he's overwhelmed, the holiness of the Lord almost doesn't leave room for him, and it uh, and he feels like he's going to die, right? And then the Lord uh, approves of him and cleanses him, and uh, and he's strengthened to go on mission. So um, I say imagine here because uh, you and I we've got lots of vivid memories of, of rejection, we've got lots of memories vivid memories of like doing things wrong or sinning or whatever it is. We've got lots of memories like that and, and we can call them up really easily. We don't have a lot of images of the Lord looking at us with love and approval uh, because of the work of Christ. We don't have a lot of images uh, or memories of the Lord's son saying um, you, you know, you are my beloved son and who I am well pleased. Uh, you are approved in Christ. You're a new creation. We don't, have, we don't have images in our mind of him looking into our eyes with compassion and kindness and saying, I love you. But, but that's just it. We kind of need that, don't we? Um, because unless we have that, uh, this is going to be a little bit two-dimensional, right? So sometimes it's not enough to just think about scriptures that talk about the love of the Lord. Sometimes we have to actually imagine. We have to, we have to close our eyes and sort of put ourselves in the passage and imagine that it's happening to us. Um, this is a really, really powerful weapon against shame. Um, these are not lies. These are you being able to embody what Scripture is actually telling you. So uh, in your devotions, that's something to, to try. Um, identify with Jesus and his vulnerability when you feel shame. Uh, and learn from him to despise the shame. So... Uh, Hebrews 12, 2 talks about um, how he despised the shame that was that was before him, and he, he 
endured the cross. Um, this, this has two parts to it. One is um, identifying with Jesus. Like, he knows shame too. He understands shame just like you do. Um, and you can tell him your shame. Um, so sometimes this means, like, when, when it hits you, you get off by yourself and you start talking to him about it. You start talking to him about what, what you're ashamed of. And you say, Lord, um, this is what I'm feeling. This is what I just remembered. When that happened, I felt so ashamed. This is what I felt. Lord, uh, would you be with this in me? W- would you be with me in this? He's your high priest. He's your faithful high priest. Uh, Hebrews talks all about this. So, um, so tell him your shame. Um, another one is face your shame directly and specifically with others. Um, sometimes we'll talk about struggles that we're having, using that word struggles, or we'll talk about um, certain sin issues, using the word certain sin issues. Uh, we won't get specific, and that's like using a, a blunt butter knife on shame. It just doesn't do anything. It runs right off. Uh, because shame can always come back after that vulnerability. Um, the reason that's true is that... Um, you can be sort of vulnerable, vaguely vulnerable, and shame can always come back and say, well, they don't, they don't know how bad you really are. They don't know how bad it is, really. So it's still a secret. So if they still knew you, they, they'd still reject you. Shame can always find a back door that way. Um, the reason this is important is that, is that the Lord is strong and gentle enough to hold your dignity, uh, even in exposure. So like, the hard part about telling... Uh, telling Zach all of my secrets, all my shameful secrets, is that Zach's a person. He's a sinful man, and I don't know how he's going to react. I mean, Zach's a really good guy, and I respect him a lot. But, you know, I, he, he's, still, he's still a guy, right? So I, I don't know how he's going to react, right? I don't know if he's going to get uncomfortable and not know what to say and never bring it up again. Um, I don't know if he's going to kind of laugh a little bit, think that I'm joking. I don't know if, you know, any of these things. I mean, I've, I've done these things. So, um, the hard part about being vulnerable with each other is that we don't know what we're going to get. Uh, and we may have really bad memories of what happened the last time we were vulnerable. So, um, really your hope, your anchor in this, is that the Lord is strong and gentle enough to hold your dignity even when you're exposing yourself, even when you're when you're being vulnerable. And the, the scriptures are Psalm 25, 2-3, and 1 Peter 2, 4-10. through 10. All right. That's the last one. Really, really important. Okay. Again, if you don't get anything out of this whole talk, even among these last five things, this may be the most important thing. Um, And that is receive the shame of others with compassion and patience. That is because he is compassionate and patient. Um, And we see that in Genesis 3, 21 through 23. So again, these are passages to go back to um, later. I'm going to, um, I've got eight minutes. I'm going to give you guys, uh, maybe Mike, Dayton, you guys can help me with this. Um, so, uh, actually, no, I'm just going to, I'm just going to make a call. So, um, I'm going to stop here and I'm going to open it up for questions. I don't want to keep you guys past seven unless you want to be here. I know you're, you're tired. you got other things to do. So, um, if you guys have any questions or, or anything like that, I'd love to. How would you counsel a lot of us that, you know, this may be like really new, yeah. I think somewhat overwhelming, to even begin to feel it's like where we start? Yeah, it's a lot. So, um, so what I would say is, uh, I would say go back to these, um, study these scriptures, um, I would say do that. I would say maybe even more importantly than that to begin with is start tracking when you feel shame. So just start noticing. So like during the day, um, start being on the lookout for that feeling and just start noticing when it happens. Maybe even like carry a piece of paper with you and put a check mark every time you feel it, right? And that's not so much so you can get to the root of it. That's just so that you get practice recognizing it. 
because you can't really fight it or like root it out or um, get better at reacting to it unless you know what is happening, right? Because a lot of times shame just comes and goes, it's really fast, it turns into something else before we can notice it. So you, you kind of have to just get in the, into the practice of noticing it. I mean, I a lot of the time when I'm feeling shame, I don't, I don't know that it's shame. I have, to, I have to come back to it later and realize, oh wait, no, that, was, that was a huge shame storm. Uh, and it made me do this and this and this. So, where I did that. So, uh, I, I would say those two things. Start tracking it. Uh, and start talking about it with your brothers. Uh, this is going to be awkward at first. You're just going to have to gra have grace with each other. Um, but it's going to take time to develop this language and develop this awareness. Um, yeah. I know this was a lot today. Um, I I wouldn't expect you to get all of this. Um, I. Uh, Questions? Um, so I'm going to go out on one here and say uh, this was this was probably a lot, uh, and you guys are tired tonight. Um, so uh, I guess one question I would have is. Um, uh, are there are there parts of this that you don't understand? Parts of this that are that are still really really fuzzy, or you're like, I don't, I don't even know what was going on during that part of the talk. That's kind of going out of. Mind. So you mentioned that you those <coughs> those are all negative, right? Like those aren't good things. Those are uh, yeah, no, that's right. They're. Um, they're negative and they're they're kind of destructive because they don't have anything to do with like like being vulnerable to other people or or like taking your shame to the Lord. Like they don't have anything to do with the Lord. So they're totally separate from Christ. They're totally separate from the Holy Spirit. They're just stuff that we do in our own strength to avoid shame. So they're they, over time they can be destructive. Good question. Really good question. Yeah. If you could take us a minute and speak into what what the good is to stay with shame. Yeah. And, uh, so like a dream of this bad, right? It's shame trying to hide for so long. And maybe you can speak into the why of it just a bit. Like you even mentioned some of your counseling people sometimes you have to like, help them see where their shame is and then the different emotions and have to pull it aside and like, the other emotions that like, sit and do it. Yeah. So why is that a good thing like for us? Maybe speaking to the That's a really good question. Yeah. So it's uh, so why is why is it important to, to sometimes go ahead and sit in that feeling of shame instead of moving it to something else or yeah um, so it's it's important because we um, it's happening whether we like it or not right it's happening all the time sometimes we turn it into something else but the more we turn it into something else uh, the more power it has right the more it, it comes back to bite us later. Right, so this is true of, of memories in our stories. This is true of stuff that we tell ourselves every day. Um, so it's important to go back and face it because we can't we can't get past it um, and and sort of learn to, to overcome it unless we face it square on, unless we just face it head on and feel it for what it is. Now that doesn't mean you have to stay there. Uh, in fact, if you're if you're feeling shame and then processing it with the Lord. Processing with your brothers, then you, you're probably not going to stay. But you're going you're to move past it, right? It's not going to become this chronic thing that you can't get out of. It's actually going to you're actually going to move through it pretty fast. Um, even even just physiologically, like um, when when you're feeling shame, your brain uh, parts of your brain sort of go offline. They sort of shut down. Uh, and one of the one of the main things that brings that back online is looking into somebody's face and describing something that's vulnerable and seeing in their face that they get you, that they, that they, that they understand what you're feeling, that you're not alone anymore, uh, that, that they get you, right? And that they're not, that they're not going anywhere, right? So that, that look of compassion or like, oh, dude, that, that sucks, I'm sorry. Uh, let's keep talking about that. That look and that feeling um, is one of the main things that makes shame makes your brain start to change, make your heart start to change. Uh, God made us so that um, the only cure for shame that we have 
is in community with the Lord and community with other people. Right? He actually wired our brains so that the only way to get past shame is to is to see is to see that look, you know, metaphorically speaking, in the Lord's face and in other people's faces. Right. So um, so that's one reason why it's important to go ahead and go there and feel it. Because if we don't, then we, we can't we can't do anything. We can't, our brains can't change, our hearts can't change, uh, we can't, we're, we're still afraid of that exposure all the time. Thanks, that's a good question. Did you raise your hand? I did, but I can answer it. Okay. Yeah. Um, what do you say to a lot of us that are just beginning to have friendships of like, yeah. probably coming to Christ in like substantial death, yeah. and then you hear this, you're like, I would love to share yeah. something, but it just almost feels like paralyzing. Yeah. How would, like, what would you encourage <clears throat> that person? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so why? What, what would you do if you're just starting to, to develop deep friendships and this, this feels overwhelming and it's like, I, I'm not going to I'm not gonna put myself out on a limb this much, right? So absolutely. So, so like, um, I would say baby steps. Um, this doesn't happen overnight and, and like you you uh, you get over shame by um, by taking small risks, small calculated risks, steadily, right, one after the other. Uh, you don't have to spill it all at once. In fact, it's probably not good for you to spill everything at once. Uh, you wanna you wanna be vulnerable with people that you learn that you can trust, right? So it's not healthy to be closed off for the rest of your life, and it's also not healthy to just tell every secret that you have to every stranger. The rest of your life, right? Those, those are are sort of uh, ways of dealing with shame that are not healthy. So, just I would say, like, if you're in that place, then um, go home tonight and think about, okay, if I if I had something on my chest and I uh, and I wanted to take not like a big risk, but like a risk like that, uh, what would what would I do? What who would I tell? And what would I tell? Them, right? Who would I trust with that? And and what would I tell them? And how would I say it? Right? And think about that. You know, it doesn't mean you're you're committing to it. it just just means you're you're thinking about okay, what what if I what if I told this secret to my leader or to my roommate? Right? What would that be like? Um, you could even go to your roommate or your leader and say, dude, I have um, I have a secret that I've never told anyone, uh, or I have a struggle that I've never told anyone about, and I don't know what to do with it. And I'm not ready to tell you this yet, but I, I hope I hope to be ready to tell you at some point. So, um, could you pray for me in that? Could you help me in that? Um, uh, yeah, and, and that leader hopefully would be able to to walk you through that. Um, uh, no leader should ever demand of you that you demand vulnerability of you, or or like say um, uh, you have to tell me the secret. It's, it's yours to tell. It's yours to tell or to hold back. It always is. Uh, but sometimes we need a little bit of help or a little bit of a nudge to get over the hump. So that's what I'd say. Is, uh, is think about a small risk that you can take. Um, and uh, and then keep keep thinking about those risks over and over and over again. That's, that's part of friendship.